Okay, we'll start. Welcome everyone. Um, delighted to welcome uh, you to this seminar um, on developing inter interdisciplinary approaches to health crises collaboratively, hosted by the Irish Research Council. I'm Peter Brown, Director of the IRC. And for those of you who may be attending from outside Ireland, uh, the mandate of the IRC is to fund excellent research across all disciplines from arts to zoology. We manage around 1500 research awards, the majority of which are at the early career stage. And we're delighted to, to welcome so many people uh, to attend today and we're looking forward uh, to an interesting discussion on, on the topic at hand. Um, I want to give a particular, albeit virtual welcome to our keynote sp speaker, Professor Trish Greenhalgh. Uh, we'd prefer to be wel welcoming you in person to Dublin, Trish, but uh, hopefully it won't be too long before in-person events are the norm again. I also want to welcome our panelists, um, Patricia Carney, uh, Professor of Epidemiology in University College Cork, Dr. Mairead O'Driscoll, CEO of the Health Research Board, Jonathan Durham, Senior Inspector in the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and Dr. Eda Meal, lecturer in uh, European History in Carlow College. And full, full biographies for our panelists and indeed our keynote speaker are provided in the documentation sent to participants in advance. And in terms of the agenda for today, uh, following the keynote from Professor Greenhalgh, there will be some time for Q&A. Then we will move to a panel discussion on interdisciplinary approaches to health crises. The final part of the seminar uh, features a short presentation on the upcoming Dorothy Fellowship Call, which of course is co-funded by the European Union under Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions, as well as the IRC and the other two agencies represented here today, namely uh, the HRB uh, and EPA. And indeed, we're delighted to be partnering with HRB and EPA on this, on this fellowship call. Um, and the, this three-way partnership builds on a number of bilateral partnerships already between the IRC and, and the agencies. The Dorothy um, Fellowship is named after Dorothy Stockford Price, uh, the pioneering and I think under-recognized scientist who made a huge contribution to eliminating the TB virus and the associated uh, death toll uh, through the BCG vaccine. I'm particularly pleased uh, to have the grandniece of, of Dorothy Stockford Price, Sandra Lafroy, joining us today and she'll say a few words later about her grand aunt. Um, and indeed Sandra has a whole litany of interesting connections in including being uh, related to William Wordsworth. Um, my colleague uh, uh, Brenda Blake from the IRC will then present on the upcoming Dorothy call. The, the topic of our seminar today, and indeed the, the, the Dorothy co-fund, um, resonates very strongly uh, with the IRC's mandate uh, on a number of levels. We fund excellent research across all disciplines, uh, and, and this pillar of our mandate has enabled us to lead on supporting interdisciplinary research and intersectoral collaboration. And the IRC has been consistently supporting and encouraging this, this through a variety of different instruments for a number of years. Using evidence and research for policy and creating a vibrant ecosystem of knowledge exchange at the nexus between research and policy and action is going to be increasingly important as we seek to confront a whole series of, of national and indeed global challenges in health, sustainability, climate and biodiversity, to name a few. Um, we encourage uh, attendees on today's seminar to pose questions for our keynote speaker and indeed for our panelists. And you can do so uh, using the, the Q&A function on your screen. Uh, you may not see the question pop up, but we will receive it and we'll do our best to draw on as many questions as possible from our community of attendees today. Um, and right at the end of Trisha's presentation, there's some really interesting questions which we can reflect on. Um, and indeed, please feel free to, to use the Q&A to make, to make comments on this or indeed ask a related question. And so to Professor Greenhalgh. Um, she is Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences and Fellow of Green Templeton College at the University of Oxford. She leads a programme of research uh, at the interface between the social sciences and medicine, working across primary and secondary care. Her work seeks to celebrate and retain the traditional and the humanistic aspects of medicine and healthcare while also embracing the unparalleled opportunities of contemporary science and technology to improve health outcomes and relieve suffering. And she's brought this interdisciplinary perspective to bear on the research response to the COVID-19 pandemic, including um, uh, policy and decision-making in conditions of uncertainty. And Trish was awarded the OBE for services to medicine by, by Queen Elizabeth in 2001. So Trish, um, huge welcome once again, and I'm delighted to hand over to you now for your keynote. 
Great stuff. Thank you, Peter. Can someone just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. So, so the technical rehearsal worked seamlessly for once. Yes, de developing interdisciplinary uh, approaches to health crises collaboratively. This was a really interesting challenge for me. There's a lot of words on, the, on that card that I, I have tried to cover in this, in this talk. So let, let's see how I go. If in, in, in England, where I live, in, in Britain, um, there isn't this overarching research council. Um, there's the Medical Research Council, the Economic and Social Research Council, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and men, much of my work is medical. Um, and actually, if we, if we look at the pandemic and we look at a very in a very narrow unidisciplinary way, uh, you say to people, you know, Boris Johnson yesterday, you know, what were the big things, the big discoveries in the pandemic? Uh, he talked about drugs and vaccines. Um, and, you know, these, of course, were developed and tested uh, partly through randomized controlled trials, although there were obviously there was a bit of basic science, a lot of basic science underpinning all that. And, and these were impressive. They were very early wins. But we all know that wasn't the total story of the pandemic. That kind of research didn't definitively and perhaps didn't at all help us answer some of the, the most pressing and the most contested questions. And two years on, we're still arguing what kind of personal protective equipment should be worn by what kind of healthcare workers or other workers, and indeed by the, the lay public. We're asking questions about schools. You know, should we be, should we ever have um, required kids to be homeschooled? Shouldn't we have kept schools open? Physical distancing, what used to be called social distancing and the whole lockdown agenda. We're still arguing about that. And all the research that's been done in those kind of fields, perhaps, has thrown more heat than light on these very complex topic areas. Now, rather than continue to talk about research, I thought I'd talk about crisis. Because uh, until we understand what we mean by crisis, we can't really research it, can we? We're going to unpack this term. And there's a great book here um, by Bowen and colleagues uh, on the politics of crisis management, it was written before the pandemic, but it has a lot to say about the, the kind of crisis we met in the pandemic. They define a crisis as a combination of threat, uncertainty and urgency, and also something that's really, really important, if you like. It's a big threat, not a tiny threat. And they say that there are five leadership tasks in any pandemic, all of which ought to be underpinned by some kind of research discovery. We need to make sense of real-time data. This is the same in a public health crisis as it is in a political crisis or you know, a crisis, let, let's say Ukraine, you know, a, a war and peace crisis. Um, the, the second leadership task is decision-making and coordinating. And when I look back to early 2020, coordination of decisions was, was something that um, was a big challenge. Constructing a meaningful account of what is happening, making sense of the crisis, again in real time, and, and communicating that uh, both to, to, to the public, but also to different parts of government and uh, different parts of, of, of uh, local and regional policy. Um, those, those communicative co components, I think we can all look back and say, crikey, that we, we didn't realise how important that was at the time. Um, we got very heavily into the data. Then there's managing accountability. Uh, what's happening right now um, where I am is that there's a lot of kind of inquiries and, um, you know, audits in inverted commas as to what happened and might we have done better and then learning learning from the crisis preparing for the next crisis so those are the kind of things that we need to get our heads around in in any crisis of any kind okay now in crisis one of the things they say in this book is that 
policy making involves what they call tragic choices. Um, and I remember that the kind of work I got involved with right at the beginning uh, was this, this um, these slogans that we had, stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Actually, the first one was stay home, um, protect the NHS and save lives. And my question was, well, should people really be staying home when they need to be in hospital? Um, but so the tragic choice of telling people to stay home when they were very sick, the tragic choice of closing schools, of closing businesses, of furlough, um, and then getting everyone to wear masks. Um, it was it was unprecedented. It was extraordinary. And I think we're all still quite traumatized by it. But I think the idea that crisis involves these kind of choices um, or indeed not choices, but mandated changes to our our, our lives. Um, I haven't seen my son for four years. You know, I didn't say goodbye to my dying mother. These these were not things that I ever anticipated. So that's the territory we're in. And in the UK, um, pan and pandemic, and you can tell this is a slide borrowed from, from a, a, a talk I've given in the UK, um, pandemic policy making was arguably characterized by poor decisions. Not every decision was poor, but there were certainly some, some poor decisions, ineffective interventions, waste of resources, if you look at the money that was spent, uh, was it spent efficiently? Bitter squabbles with, between different parts of government, etc. But also erosion of trust and quite staggering loss of life. Um, so I think now that we're taking stock, I think we have to be realistic. I have deliberately not ferreted around to find comparable uh, statements of, about Ireland, uh, because I think it's not my business to make those statements of, about Ireland. I don't even know whether they're true or not. Let's hope not. Um, but certainly in many countries, this was this is the kind of mess we're now looking back at. So let's now look at policymaking. Um, policymaking is sometimes it kind of envisioned as a very rational thing. Uh, rational decision making, following the science, doing some studies that give you scientific facts and then putting them into uh, the policy cycle. It's mostly a quantitative science if we look at it like this, and it is a science rather than an art. It's about weighing up two or more different courses of action and saying the evidence supports this action rather than that action. Um, finding out what works and then implementing it. I think it was Tony Blair that, that expressed policy making in that way. Um, and actually, when we look at the biomedical policy making or the healthcare policy making, there is a major emphasis on randomized controlled trials. Of course, that's not all that goes on, but uh, that is the, the view of policy making in some circles. And now let's look at an alternative view. Um, you may know the work of Deborah Stone. Uh, who depict, and, and she and many others, depict policy more as argument, more as rhetoric. It's about narrativizing. It's about telling a particular story of what's happened so far and why, and taking that story into the future and saying, this is now why we need to continue the narrative in this direction. It's very much about framing. Um, how do we frame for example, child vaccination, do we frame it as protecting the child or do we frame it as protecting the child's grandparents, for example? Um, and actually that, that, was, uh, uh, that particular framing was, is why currently we're not vaccinating young children in, in uh, Britain because uh, it was framed as protecting the child. Um, persuading, the art of persuasion, policy making is the art of persuasion, and even enacted drama. So this is much more a kind of arts and humanities framing of, uh, uh, of social science slash arts and humanities framing of policy. Uh, in this view of policy making, it's a contact sport uh, between ideas, institutions, and interests. It's fundamentally about power, uh, and actually one of the big things it's about is ideas about what the problems are. Um, and we saw this actually yesterday in, in um, the UK Parliament where Matt Hancock got up and said the pandemic's over. We're the first country that's got rid of the pandemic. Um, oh, the pandemic's over, is it? And that's the framing that is being taken. So our policy now 
uh, is to act as if it's over. Uh, and we won't go into that too much, but you can see um, this version of this lens on policy making um, is perhaps, I find it much more interesting actually. All right, one more, um, uh, a couple more slides on, on, on policy. This uh, book by Heyer and Wagner, and again, this was published pre-pandemic, but I think hugely relevant, is that policy making now is, a, is something that doesn't just happen in the seat of government. There's lots of different sites of policy making. There, there is, to a greater or lesser extent, distributed policy making. There's a lot of um, a, a lot of interconnectedness and interdependence from these various different ways that policy gets made uh, by different groups. Sometimes there's more consultation than there ever was. Uh, but there's also, in contemporary times, what these authors call radical uncertainty. Um, there are limits to what we can know, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, and all this stacks up to um, erode trust in policymakers. If you take us back 50 or 60 years, policymakers were trusted a lot more than they currently are. Uh, and finally, they talk about the transformations of the digital world. And I think it's really quite interesting the way the Ukraine crisis is unfolding on Twitter. Um, how, did, how does that happen, that, that you can actually start a war by putting out a tweet? It's really weird. OK, we won't get too distracted in that, but I just want to kind of take you slightly into this, um, I would call it a slightly postmodern territory. I'll, don't worry, I'll bring you back again. Um, one more book around policymaking, which I think is pretty key to, to what we're talking about, you know, this interdisciplinary work post-pandemic. Um, uh, this is a very recently published book, uh, again by Wagner and also a woman called Barbara Prensack, uh, who's at the University of Vienna. Uh, they're both at Vienna, I think. What they say is that in the pandemic, this whole approach of following the science, I think it's an extraordinary slogan. What it meant was um, prioritizing and privileging and stacking up and then trying to follow a particular kind of scientific evidence. And what got dropped off the agenda again and again and again was, was the structural inequalities uh, that explain so much of the differences in, in, in how my pandemic unfolded compared to the pandemic of someone from a very different social class, a different ethnic background, a different age, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the following the science narrative uh, took us into the, the sort of uh, biomedical framing, the randomized controlled trials, but also, uh, as Boris Johnson said yesterday, individual responsibility for particular acts and behaviors rather than addressing um, the, uh, what, what they call in this book, the need for universal basic services. Everyone uh, needs to uh, have uh, access to enough to eat, shelter, um, healthcare, education, et cetera. And those, uh, if we had addressed the need for universal basic services, uh, rather than, for example, chasing uh, monoclonal antibodies, we may have saved more lives. So this is a very interesting and, and, and quite radical book. Okay, now let's just take a look at um, uncertainty, because if you remember right at the beginning, I've talked about this book about uh, crisis and one component of crisis, one key defining feature of a crisis is uncertainty. Uh, the pandemic was characterized by uncertainty uh, and still is, I think. This is a really interesting thing that two years on, there's so many questions we haven't answered, nor are we ever going to. But uh, the scientists and policymakers were largely pursuing certainty. In other words, they, they, they were waiting for a particular piece of science to come up with the truth. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff around evidence-based practice, evidence-based policymaking, and policy decisions waited for, for sufficient scientific certainty uh, before they were made. So actually, I felt uh, personally there was a lot of hanging about um, because nobody wanted to act under conditions of uncertainty. Now, uncertainty is laid bare in times of crisis, uh, and those times are characterized by a particular kind of uncertainty. 
unknown unknowns. If you, you know, I think it was Rumsfeld who talked about known knowns and unknown unknowns. Now, what I mean by that is a known unknown is where you can express uh, the unknown in terms of a, a particular question. You know, what, what were we talking about this morning? What is the impact of shoulder surgery for a particular type of sprain of the shoulder? We may not know that, but we know what the question is, and we can then go and do a randomized controlled trial and get the answer. That wasn't the kind of uncertainty that characterized the pandemic. The pandemic was characterized by, hey, what the hell are the questions? Or is that question an important question? Or is it a, a marginal question? And I would say we are still in the territory of unknown unknowns. Uh, and that is a scary place to be when your model of the science policy relationship is for science to serve up truth for policymakers to then put into uh, practice and policy. This is a fundamental critique of the science policy relationship. And I think the crisis threw it into the air and we, we now have to note it. Um, as I've said, the combination of uncertainty and threat and urgency and everything that kind of happened in that tumbling, unfolding way in early 2020 led to a profound erosion of trust, certainly in my country, but I think in many, many countries, people stopped trusting uh, their governments. Um, you can see here um, these big protests. Uh, you know, they're still, you know, these truckers in Canada driving their, their trucks to bring society to a halt, to protest against the policies that are being put into place. And then I've given you a clip from uh, Indy Sage criticizing the government from the opposite direction, saying, wait a minute, you're not going far enough. Um, and the strength of feeling about this, this um, unease, this lack of trust is not marginal, it's central, it needs to be researched, it needs to be understood, uh, and we need to do something about it. So, again, I'm, I'm criticizing my own government here. I hope you don't think I'm being too radical. You, you know, you're welcome to disagree. There's lots of time afterwards for you to disagree with me. But, but in my view is that the UK government and the public health authorities made a number of errors. Um, they failed to grasp the essential nature of crisis, which is that there is inherent uncertainty and they needed to make urgent decisions to avert a major threat even in the absence of scientific certainty. They approached policymaking as a logical endeavor, which was grounded in scientific rationality, which favored a very narrow kind of evidence, biomedical evidence, randomized trial evidence. They assumed that uncertainty was temporary and would be eliminated by science, so that they, what they wanted was to get certainty and then act. And they conflated knowledge with the numbers, really, these very abstracted, decontextualized uh, numbers, such as the R value, such as the effect size of an intervention that you get from an RCT. Uh, and they then communicated with the public, chiefly via declarations of what I would call false certainty. In other words, they claimed to be certain, but they actually, there was a huge amount of uncertainty, but that was kind of brushed under the carpet. All right. Let me give you a couple of examples that you, you may, if you know my name at all, you probably know it from the face masks arguments that I had with Carl Hennigan in my own department. Um, right back, um, we wrote this at the beginning of March, it was published on the 2nd of April 2020, uh, arguing for the precautionary principle saying, look, we haven't got much evidence on masks yet, but it looks like it might help. Let's wear them just in case. Uh, and my colleague, Carl Hennigan, was saying, no, we've looked at all these randomized controlled trials and no evidence, uh, let's not do anything. Likewise, in terms of whether we should shield the vulnerable and sort of lock everybody up who's, who's not in 100% peak health, especially if they're old, or whether we should have blanket policies involving everyone. And you can see the way the British Medical Journal framed this, experts divide into two camps. Uh, and I've probably done a couple of hundred radio, television and, and, and newspaper uh, appearances where I'm presented as one pole 
of a divide and somebody else has been brought on as another pole of the divide. And in fact, once I got together with my so-called opponent and we wrote a piece for the conversation saying, please, can you stop doing it like this? We need to come together and, and deliberate and, and, and stop being polarized, but it doesn't look like that's gonna happen anytime soon. So let's go just to use the masks example for, for one or two slides. On the left is the EBM view. You know that hierarchy of evidence with randomized trials at the top. And then as you go from the red down into the blue, you value each layer of evidence slightly less until expert opinion gets almost no marks. So when you value randomized controlled trials over other evidence and you chuck away anything that's not an RCT, this did seem to support the masks don't work narrative, or certainly there is no evidence that masks do work narrative. But what my team were arguing was actually, if you take lots of different kinds of evidence and pull those together, um, that strongly supports a narrative of masks do work and they work very well. So the idea that we were putting forward or the argument we were putting forward was that multiple kinds of evidence taken together, if you put all this together, builds a very strong case for a causal mechanism for the mask. So the first kind of study that um, Professor Hennigan rejected was the animal studies where you connect up the cages. Of, uh, I've, I've actually shown you a guinea pig, but they did it with hamsters and ferrets, but whatever, small animal. Uh, and you have one cage of animals that's got COVID and you connect an air duct to the cage of another set of animals that doesn't have COVID uh, and the, the animals in the second cage catch COVID. Now that seems to me to be pretty good evidence of the mechanism by which this virus spreads, but, it, but of course the RCT people said, no, 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 it's not an RCT and it's in an animal, so it doesn't count. And then there were all the lots of other kinds of evidence which all put together made a, an incredibly compelling case. The, sneeze studies where people measure all the kind of snot and gob that comes out of you when you sneeze or cough and measure how far it travels, whether you are or aren't wearing a mask. The super spreader spreading events, particularly in gyms and churches where people are singing and all that kind of thing was very strong evidence we felt for an airborne transmission. The quarantine cases where people um, are in quarantine hotels and they managed to catch the same genetic strain of COVID as someone who's breathed the same air but never met them, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then and then the sort of cultural evidence of, of what masks mean. Uh, and engineering evidence, I've said, the the uh, filtration standards that are built into the respirator type mask. So we pulled all that together and we said, goodness me, people should be wearing masks. Um, but uh, the RCT people didn't agree. Here's an interesting um, interdisciplinary study. I haven't got many of these. I've just got this one to tell you about Crystal Lee, uh, because there are all sorts of people gave her a hard time on the internet. She's only a postdoc. Um, but she did this beautiful, elegant study of those people who say, do your own research. And she did um, ethnography. She joined Facebook groups of these data analysts who are doing their own research, but she also did some very, very skilled quantitative analysis of where all the messages were going. Uh, and she came up with this really interesting study of anti-maskers who are not stupid or ignorant. They're actually very clever at um, data visualization and they create these alternative data visualizations uh, of what is going on. Uh, but in addition, they're highly suspicious of authorities. They don't work in universities because they don't like institutions. Um, they engage very critically with the official pictures and charts and, and, and numbers, and then they create their own and they distribute them around the internet. Um, and that's where do your own research comes from. It's strongly linked with libertarian um, philosophy and ideology. And so this interdisciplinary paper is bringing computer science, anthropology, um, quite a lot of epidemiology and public health all into a single paper. Uh, and actually, it'd be a really good one for you to look at when you're saying, well, what, you know, what, what is a good postdoc capable of doing? How many disciplinary bases can they touch and embrace in, in a single paper? Um, so here's um, a little chart that I made 
of uh, the difference between the narrow evidence-based medicine paradigm and the complex system paradigm. And you can see I'm, I'm much more of a, a, a fan of the latter um, in which scientific truth may be multiple. The goal of research is not to nail a single numerical truth, but to explore tensions and patterns, for example. Causality is, is, is emergent rather than linear. Um, it's not that you know, X causes Y. It's much more, more complex than that because X might contribute to Y, but only in the presence of something else, et cetera, et cetera. Um, good research is not defined by a single method. It's based on multiple methods. Um, but actually, this goal of theorizing is, is key. Um, in your EBM paradigm, your, your, your simple monodisciplinary paradigm, often the, the very goal of theorizing is simplification and abstraction. And I think the R number is a very good example of that. It becomes a shorthand. But actually, in, in the complex systems paradigm, the goal of theorizing is conjunctive. In other words, drawing different parts together to depict the whole. Um, and the ethical assumptions are also um, different and more negotiable. I'm not going to go into that too much or I'm going to run out of time. So let me introduce you very, very briefly to a philosophical position that I've, I've recently become rather excited with, which is pragmatism. Now, pragmatism doesn't just mean being pragmatic, which is something I've always been uh, fairly pragmatic uh, you know, as an individual, but, but there's a whole philosophy of pragmatism and philosophers write books about it. I've, I've become friendly with uh, Cheryl Missack, who's a, a big pragmatist philosopher. Um, and what have I learned from her and her teams? Well, there's five key principles. The first one is that science is fallible, always fallible. Theory is always under determined by data. So we need to reason abductively as well as deductively we need to say for example what might explain this or what might partially explain this even though we know it's not going to explain everything secondly that ideas and action are inseparable um, pragmatists say a belief is something on which one is prepared to act even if one isn't a hundred percent sure that it's true um, I, I might be sure enough that masks work uh, even though I'm not 100% sure, so I'll wear one on the off chance. So it's really interesting uh, the way pragmatism allows us, in fact, compels us to act, even in the absence of scientific certainty. Thirdly, the pragmatists said we need to look at problems in multiple ways. They argue very much against um, monism uh, and scientism. Um, they love the kind of richness of, of all those different methodological approaches that I was showing you uh, about our masks work. Um, they're also very into what they call human logic, the idea that different groups of humans see the world differently and they do their science and they do their policy making through those different human lenses. So how people frame the issues matters as much as any kind of hard fact. And I think those are, I mean, those of you who are from the environmental uh, groups will know that different people see environmental science in hugely different ways. And unless you understand where they come from, you're not gonna get to, to, to first base in any dialogue. Um, and then this participatory democracy um, tenet that we need to build solutions with communities rather than for them or on them. So those are just some of the key tenets of, of pragmatism. I think they're hugely important. We've just sort of drafted a paper on how pragmatism might help crisis policymaking. There's all sorts of uh, research approaches that are either explicitly or implicitly drawing on these principles. And you can, I'm not gonna read them all out, but I bet you've funded a few of these. Uh, in, in your time, and certainly that top right patient and public involvement and engagement, the whole PPIE stream is really built on the pragmatist principles that we need to get into this kind of dialogue and that the public may shape our science uh, in, in ways that improve it, improve the ethics of it and improve the kind of relevance of it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots to talk about there. 
so just to remind you of where I started with this book, The Politics of Crisis Management and these different leadership tasks, I now want to come forward to leave you with um, uh, some ideas about how pragmatism may help you with that. We need to move from waiting for certain truths to making science-informed judgments in uncertain times. So that whole scientific fallibilism tenet fits uh, very much with crisis management, I think. From an approach which says knowledge then action to acting under uncertainty, we need to be able to apply the precautionary principle in a timely way and appropriately. Moving from rigid hierarchies of evidence to epistemological pluralism. Moving from polarized camps, as I, and I said, I don't really like being put at one side of a pole, um, to what Schoen and Ryan have called frame reflective deliberation. Understand where all the sides are coming from and only then will you be able to, uh, to talk solutions. And finally, from a sort of inside track approach to science influencing policy. It's only you, you and you are going to be able to advise government. Uh, what about some uh, participatory democracy where we have true deliberation and discussion? Um, OK, so let me leave you with these questions. And these are pragmatist questions. You can take them or leave them. And if they're not relevant, we don't have to talk about them, talk about other things. But I think they may be relevant. How can policy bodies move beyond a scientistic approach in which they commission advice on what works and then follow it? Because I hope I've tried to persuade you that that may not actually be the best way forward in crises. Secondly, what structures, systems and tools could help policymakers move from linear models of knowledge to action uh, to a more knowledge through action approach? Thirdly, how can the distorting influence of evidence hierarchies and technocratic approaches to assessing evidence be overcome? Fourthly, how can frame awareness be applied to increase mutual understanding and reduce polarization as our values and ideologies are brought to bear on, on the science we do? Uh, and fifthly, how can we ensure that deliberations on urgent policy decisions go beyond a narrow group of favored advisors? And those for me are the really key uh, questions that we need to, to deal with before the next big crisis hits. So thank you for your attention. I will now stop sharing. I haven't seen any chat or Q and A's yet because I, 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 I haven't, um, I haven't been able to because I've been looking at the screen, but I'm sure there are some, but I can see there are some, but I'll hand back to the chair now. Thank you, Trish, for what was an incredibly insightful presentation. I think, you know, I think it, 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 it highlights such a huge and urgent agenda for discussion. Um, and and there, is, there are some questions coming in and I would like to, uh, I would um, ask the audience to get your, we have a small amount of time, for Q&A before our panel discussion. So to do, if you, if you want to uh, ask a question of, of, of Trish, please get uh, use the Q&A function. We do have a comment here about um, the relationship between um, erosion of trust and, and the, the, the premise that a healthcare system is succeeding. Um, so uh, John Wells here writes about um, uh, David Mechanic writing in the early 90s, highlighting in relation to healthcare that trust is predicated on a perception that health services are succeeding. And once there is a perception of not succeeding, trust is eroded um, and the message has to match the collective and individual experience. Um, I don't know if you have any comment on that, Trish. Oh, I would strongly agree with it, though. I would strongly agree with it. But I would say that we could theorize that through what the pragmatists call uh, human logic or, or symbolic interactionism. I think that's that's absolutely right, that the stories we tell and the sense making uh, of the crisis and everything that led up to it has to be front and center. Yeah. yeah. Another um, uh, point, I suppose, that struck me, you, you think you had, you had um, on one of your slides, you had, uh, I think it was five issues arising um, from the crisis of policymaking, but it seems to me that, that at least three of them 
are questions are, are uh, you know questions that we can still answer and um, such as the lessons that can be learned and uh, what in fact what are the questions that we should have been asking all along mm -hmm. and issues of accountability so the opportunity is still there to to really fundamentally engage with, with most if not of the if not all of those questions i, I hope so yeah that's why i'm here <laughs> And, and I, before we went kind of live to the audience, I was saying what an amazing initiative this is. And I wish there was something equivalent in my country, but you've got a huge opportunity here. Uh, and I'm, you know, I've deliberately encouraged you to be bold. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about the challenge for policymakers to draw together different kinds of evidence. Um, and it seems as much it seems as much of an agenda for researchers as it is for for policymakers, um, and, and it's probably particularly a, a challenge for policymakers. So, how do we how do we get to that place where whereby um, you know we're both producing uh, and using uh, evidence that is drawn together from a variety of different interdisciplinary sources? It's quite a it is quite a challenge, isn't it? Do you know that's what used to happen wasn't it I, I mean i think the other thing is that um, there were a lot more interdisciplinary scientists and researchers in in the old days um you know i went out with someone when i was an undergraduate whose great uncle was jbs Haldane. he used to describe this guy doing biology or doing physics or doing chemistry you know in the basement of their house um, that's just what you did in those days. You, you didn't just sit in a very narrow discipline. I think where things have gone, you know, slightly screwy is that we have got ourselves into the mindset that, that scientific monism uh, with this hierarchy of evidence, with this very narrow uh, methodology or methodolatry driven um ranking um that that is somehow a kind of high form of science it's not it's it's a very limited form of science and so i think one, one and one of the problems is that, that an awful lot of people with that mindset now occupy positions of power in in policy they hang around the who for example uh, but also in um on the journal boards uh on the grant giving bodies and I think we need to make sure that, um, that it's sort of like the relationship between knowledge and power, isn't it? We want to make sure that the, the groups making the decisions are interdisciplinary. Uh, the journals are more interdisciplinary. Tomorrow, I'm actually speaking at the British Medical Journal about how, you know, a similar kind of talk, actually not the same, but because um, they're starting in a different place. But the BMJ has favoured randomised controlled trials over almost anything else. And that they have approached me saying, we think in the light of the pandemic, we need to spread out a bit. So I think things are happening. Uh, but certainly the, the question you asked me was drawing together different kinds of evidence. That used to happen until somebody came up with this idea of a very technocratic approach where you, you, know, you do your search, you chuck away everything that isn't an RCT, and you then use a, a, a technical process rather than a deliberative and, 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 and kind of scholarly approach to synthesize evidence. I think we just need to go back to what we used to do uh, before we got taught all these technocratic tricks and hierarchies. Yeah. And I think, you know, institutions obviously have a key role in trying to create that culture of interdisciplinary, yeah, yeah. And interdisciplinary scholarly uh, engagement. Having um, said that, I, I think it's really important to say, as, as a, a long-term survivor of a poor prognosis cancer, I owe my life to randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses. I am not opposed to that mm. kind of science in its place. Mm. But when we're talking about things like, should we open schools or close schools? And if so, when? Uh, that is not a question that is designed for uh, that kind. And I think the problem is there's a mismatch between... Um, you know the the study design and, and the research question and, yeah. and the idea of conjunctive theorizing i think is absolutely crucial absolutely crucial and, and we've lost that somehow 
And I see a, a comment from actually a member of our council, Professor Daniel Carey, actually interim chair of the council, um, an outstanding, an outstanding talk. And um, he says one of the implications is the need for perspectives associated with the humanities and social sciences. Uh, these voices have had relatively little purchase in public debate during the pandemic. And a question for you, Trish, is you know what is your advice or thoughts on how to address this? Goodness. Um... Do you know, I don't probably don't know enough about your particular setting or context. Um, and I think it's it, it has to it has to kind of fit with where people are coming from. I mean, I could tell you how I do it in, in the UK, but <laughs> that's slightly different. I mean, I think there's a lot about funding. There's a lot about creating streams um streams of funding to allow people to do you know what they're good at and and, and all that kind of thing and uh, certainly my daughter-in-law's a humanities scholar and there isn't the kind of funding and also the career progression that that you get if you were if you're doing clinical research for example so so there's so there's all those structural things but i think also uh there's a chap in Norway called Ivan Engelbretson. He has set up a very interesting um, institute in the University of Oslo, funded by the Research Council of Norway. No, funded by the Scandinavian Research Council. Anyway, there's a lot of money, uh, and it's called something like the Center for Humanities Education. And what he does there is he brings in philosophers and humanities people to teach undergraduate medical students and those undergraduate students have to do a humanities project uh, overseen by people from you know proper humanities scholars not people like me dabbling in it but you know people who really know what they're talking about and it has a really amazing vibe I should say I, I conflict of interest I'm an advisor to that center but actually, I'm learning huge amounts about it. So, so I think the idea that the medical groupings in any university dominate, if, if there's a medical school in the university, it, it tends to dominate. A vice chancellor once told me that. And so I think to, to, to bring the humanities in, but, but value them and nurture them, and then the next generation gets that opportunity. I mean, the, way, the reason why I'm in, so interested in the social sciences is that when I was 19, I just took a year out and studied sociology, hung out with the sociologists, you know, dyed my hair blue. And those kind of opportunities are really, really important. <laughs> yeah. that, that's definitely interdisciplinary collaboration, dyeing your hair blue. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Um, we're running, we've kind of run out of time for Q&A. I feel I've only scratched the surface of some of the questions that are coming through, Trish. But um, I know you're staying with us for the panel discussion. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much again for a really inspiring. And you can see that from the from the comments and questions that are coming through, that people have been absolutely um, inspired by, by by your presentation and, and the, the, the various insights and, and I suppose huge questions that you posed for, for I think, for researchers across disciplines. So thank you again for your um, for your keynotes, uh, Trish, and I'm delighted that you'll be staying with us. I might now move to the, um, the, the I suppose, to open out the discussion a little bit with our panel. And uh, Patricia, I might come to you first, um, maybe just to ask, I suppose, initially for your reflections on um, for your reflections on, on on Trish's presentation. I suppose any, and I know you've been you've been. I know that ter term is overused now at this stage, but you've been very much working on the front line during the pandemic, but I'd be interested in your reflections on, on Trisha's uh, presentation. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, Trish, for a fantastic um, uh, presentation, which I really enjoyed, and there were a lot of resonances um, in it for me. I teach students um, epidemiology, and I always show them that hierarchy and say, that's not how we think. You know, the, the most important or the best design depends on the question that you're asking, and um, so I was really struck by that. I suppose in terms of the pandemic, um, one of the things I had the opportunity to address the Oireachtas um, Special Committee on COVID-19 relatively early on in the pandemic. And at the time, Professor um, Carl Hennigan was one of the other people who was invited to address the committee and was very certain um, in terms of what needed to be done or, or not to be done. And I suppose one of the challenges I, you know, I think in terms of the perspective that you're 
um, you know, this kind of co complex system approach, which I completely agree with, is when, as an expert, you're then asked to speak to a topic, and you know, you acknowledge the uncertainty and the need to hear other voices. And you know, I can remember um, again being on the radio talking about COVID nineteen and saying maybe we should have a citizens assembly. You know, we need to hear what people want to do, what choices they want to make, how we can address this. But I think there's a danger that certainly from my perspective that I might come across as, you know, being equivocal on something or, you know, that I acknowledge the uncertainty. And so I think that's that's a real challenge in terms of going back maybe to Peter to what you were talking about in terms of how we actually do this, how we change the discourse, how we change yeah. how decisions are, are made and, you know, how we make that sort of giant leap, because the reality is that there was a lot of uncertainty that was really difficult and people, I think, also were hungry for yeah. a direction. Uh, yeah. that's that's very very wise that that and i think certainly policymakers don't like sharing uncertainty precisely for the reason that you've described uh, and and you're right that, that i think unless we get to a stage where we can be more comfortable with admitting uncertainty we can then start to explore that uncertainty in a meaningful way but yes it's like um, nature abhors a vacuum and you know there's a vacuum there none of us are certain oh let's bring Carl Hennigan in because he's certain about something uh, look where we are and um, the other thing maybe I, I um, uh, was thinking about you were talking about you know medical students being taught philosophy but I was wondering really do we need to go further back and I suppose you know public health kind of go as far upstream as you can and thinking about our our primary education system and you know should we look to the French where philosophy mm. was taught you know I think in our primary schools and we just need to think um, about how we better inform um, uh, everyone to, to, to understand information and interpret it um, and see how, how decisions um, yeah. get made and um, I suppose the other thing for me in terms of learnings from the pandemic one of the sadnesses for me um, was that in a time when public health has never been so sort of visible and, and you know everyone knows what an epidemiologist is now that we did and it was one of the things that you mentioned Trish around the sort of in, I think Boris Johnson used the term individual responsibility in Ireland we heard a lot about personal responsibility and to me you know personal responsibility is the absolute uh, opposite of how we approach challenges and problems in public health and I think there was a real missed opportunity of course people need to make individual choices. And for those of us, you know, but it's like the stay at home me message. You know, it's easy to stay at home if you have a lovely home. And, um, you know, if you don't have a home, how, how can you stay at home? So I think there was, a, I think to me, one of the huge uh, missed opportunities, things that went wrong in this was this emphasis on personal responsibility. And I hope we learn from that. And I think that really ties in with your sort of complex systems yeah, approach and, and recognizing that there isn't an answer. And that's that's exactly what the Wagonar and Prensac book is all about. The pandemic within is how we manage to get focused on individual behavior change and completely ignore uh, the public health. And, and actually, I'm writing a chapter at the moment with a, an African professor, Amma de Graft Aikens, who's now at UCL, but she's, she's Ghanaian. Um, and writing, she her half of the chapter is about what we call the African paradox. Is why didn't Africa do worse? You know, why didn't all those fragile health systems? Well, they actually didn't do too badly with COVID. Um, and one reason might be because they do often take a kind of boots on the ground public health approach, but they also know about strengthening um, communities at, at, at the kind of um, at the level of the village sort of thing. Uh, and that actually served them in very good stead. It's, it's more complex than that, of course, but um, yeah, public health. Thanks. Um, thanks for that, Trish and, and Patricia. Mairead, I might come to you and I'd be interested in your perspective as, as a funder, um, you know, from the HRB perspective on, I suppose, the, the questions that are being posed. And uh, it's, it, Trish was talking about participatory democracy and research. And I know the HRB has, you know, is doing some really good work in that area in terms of patient and public involvement. But it'd be interesting to hear from you on on, on those on, on some of those areas. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, it's a fantastic talk, Trish. Thanks very much. I think you, you described very eloquently the uh, 
you know, the importance of these um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches um, and how we need to draw um, on evidence and data uh, from all the different sources and perspectives, um, because of these problems, of course, are, are very complex, so you've got to approach it from, from, from all the different angles. Um, I think, I suppose, from a, from a, a funding um, point of view, a funder, actually, we found it, it was interesting um, We'd been making an investment over many years in evidence synthesis. And I mean, it was kind of, you know, we weren't obviously doing it with the pandemic in mind or no, no, no sense that a pandemic was on the way, really. But, you know, we have our own unit here in the HRB, as I say, that supports the Department of Health with very specific commission questions. And, you know, we support uh, the HRB Sizer team at HICWA and there's a, a group called Evidence Synthesis Ireland and um, we support so in a national network. So, and, you know, that did pay off, actually, because, um, you know, you almost have to develop that capacity in, in peacetime. You can't suddenly just conjure it up like when there's a crisis. So the fact that we had sort of at least invested in that, I think, uh, was very helpful. But I think it's also um, we, we, we realised the importance of, of um, international collaboration because there's so much, as you say, there's so much unknown, but it wasn't just unknown here. It's kind of unknown anywhere. You know, see, you, you know, it was very th those networks became really, really important, those um uh, those international uh, networks uh, and you know the, the, those groups and particularly evidence in Ireland got involved with them um, COVID end which was the um which was, had about 55 partners and around the world and drawn from various different uh, evidence census um communities and I think that that was good about about that group was that they spanned the full spectrum of them um, of um of responses I suppose from the public health measures uh clinical management, but also things like health systems um, um, supports and economic and social responses and so, so on. And they were also um, looking at the context. So where, you know, how the pandemic was playing out in different, different contexts, different, you know, different high income countries or low income countries. So, um, uh, so, so, so that, I think that, that's been very interesting. And of course that has, has, has spun out now into the, um, uh, this global evidence commission, um, which has been sort of taking a look at where things haven't, you know, trying try to sort of expand it out and sort of say, well, where, where, have the, where do things work? Where, where do things not work so well? Um, and also how can I suppose governments and supported by funders, you know, how can we build a better um, evidence support system, both nationally, but also internationally as well. Um, and uh, the, the, the evidence commission, uh, in particular, it's, 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 it was made up of an independent, it was made up of a panel of commissioners from all sort of types of decision makers. So, so I suppose trying to put into action that concept of participatory democracy that, that Trish referred to. So, you know, this idea that, that uh, you know, yes, you, you're going to have government policymakers and uh, academics and so on, but, but you also need um, citizens as well. So trying to discuss all the various major uh, forms of influence. So um, I think it's it's sort of interesting to see how the pandemic has, I suppose, has, has driven um, us to sort of think and about and review how we actually just organize ourselves, both nationally and internationally, to, to actually sort of change the way or, or adapt and develop the way we, we review um, um, evidence. Um, they produced quite an interesting report, uh, which was published earlier, and um, they come up with, well, there's a load of load of recommendations, but I mean, you know, they identified a number of, of, of priority recommendations but interesting one of the ones and, and to speaking to your question there Peter one of them was around you know the importance of, of um, supporting the use of evidence in everyday life so this idea that you know citizens how citizens make decisions for themselves and their families and how they use evidence to do that but of course that's not done in a, in a vacuum either I mean you know that needs to be supported in terms of access and transparency and supporting digital literacy and all of those things um, uh, and also they, 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 this idea of evidence intermediaries, because, you know, how, do, how, do, how does the evidence actually um, inform, you know, how does it have any kind of an impact? So, you know, do, uh, this, this, this role that is always needed between the decision makers and the evidence producers to sort of try and, and uh, mediate um, that. So, I mean, I think there's a huge amount um, um, happening just generally in that, in that space. And, and I suppose, yes, I mean, as a funder, you know, um, you know, we should yes, we should probably be spending more in this area on evidence support. But I suppose we have to think about how we spend it as well. Um, how do, how do you actually do that? To you know, how do you spend spend smarter? Um, as they say. Um, so that's really just uh, some of the thoughts um, that that I had listening to to the presentation. And I and I think this kind of research really, and we'll, I suppose we'll get on later to talk about the Dorothy program. But it, it sort of um, underlines as well the need to develop different skill sets. 
um, in our research community. And I think you touched on it there. Why is everybody so silo siloed? Because of course the whole concept, I think probably of the interdisciplinary uh, research is that, you know, so is, is that one area is informing another area and you have to be kind of comfortable working in that gray space in the middle. So I think um, uh, the skill sets around that are probably quite different, you know, in terms of our, our doctoral training, our postdoctoral training skill sets that you're going to need, I think, are quite different uh, compared to, um, um, you know, the, the, the standards, I suppose, uh, training programs. So there's just some thoughts, Peter. Thanks. And thanks, Mairead. No, there's a lot in there. And I think we'll come back to some of those points. Um, Jonathan, I might turn to you. Um, Obviously, the, you know, environmental and um, there's a massive interrelationship between the environment and health. Um, and I know, you know, the EPA is regularly highlighting, for instance, deterioration in the quality of our rivers, monitoring air quality. Um, and I think even just today or yesterday, uh, you, 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 had, there was, uh, you had a report on, on issues with uh, rural drinking water schemes. So I suppose from an EPA point of view, what do you see, you know, as, as the role and potential for interdisciplinary research to enhance you know, policy and, and related outcomes on, on, on the environment. Thanks, Peter, uh, for the, and thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it's, um, when you look around nationally and you see all the effort and news that goes into challenging and addressing death associated with road traffic, as around 136 people die a year in our roads, yet from an environmental point of view, you know, we have about 250 deaths associated with radon induced lung cancer every year. We have 1,300, 1,300 people die prematurely due to air pollution. Uh, uh, so, and we also have uh, stress and sleep disturbance associated with uh, noise in our urban areas that lead to deteriorating health as well. When you add all that up, there's an enormous underlying concern here that environmentally introduced, induced health challenges. And if ever there was a place for this interdisciplinarity, or in fact, what I, I like the Royal Irish Academy's approach where they talk about transdisciplinarity, yeah. which is this integration of co-design, which Trish talked about deliberative bringing in citizens and indeed the end users, bringing in the policymakers or the implementators into the design of the research enterprise. And uh, so co-design and the interdisciplinarity element. And we've seen that uh, uh, through, we've worked with our health people in Askeaton, the animal, the uh, Akinish Illumina issues in silver mines uh, and in uh, bathing waters, drinking waters, where we try to uh, work our language that lands better really in this kind of environment and health uh, space. And we've had really good success in around the value of green and blue spaces, working with our colleagues in HRC. So it is, it's a very powerful narrative when it works well, uh, this kind of uh, uh, joining up between the, the environment agencies and uh, the health agencies. And it is the only way to take on these kind of wicked challenges, these wicked problems, which are systemic and what the Europeans are now calling transversive. Um, one of the very obvious places we're seeing good success, Peter, is in the, anti uh, the INAP, the Antimicrobial Resistance National Action Plan, where you've got Department of Health, the HSE, the EPA, and Department of Agriculture and their people all involved in a One Health approach. And it's quite interesting to see how how successful that is and bringing behavioral scientists and engaging with farmers and farmers' behaviors and you know, how they deal with veterinary medicines that they would introduce themselves right through to pure science. And, and I think uh, we don't understand enough on, uh, in relation to how the environment is acting as a vector for health outcomes. Uh, and uh, you know, our health and our environment is impacted through our built environment. We could have sick building syndrome, poor fabrics that are making us ill, or poor ventilation that are making us ill. So uh, in how well and what we consume might have toxins in it. And of course, our natural environment is another sort of uh, mode of contact. So I think there is an enormous amount of space for a transdisciplinary approach to try understanding 
the role of, of the environment in, in uh, delivering better health outcomes, both positively and negatively, in fact. Um, and yeah, the, that, that AMR One Health, I think, is particularly strong. Um, one of the things I talked that I thought, uh, um, uh, Trish, in, in your, and I think uh, Patricia mentioned it as well, is that uh, individuality, one of the greatest crimes we see in sort of the environmental harms uh, is this love affair with individualism, you know, whether it's manifested through consumption or poor behaviors when it comes through pollution. Um, but what, what I found heartening uh, as a learning from uh, the public response to COVID, yes, there was a drive that individuals have to do uh, better, but I thought the underlying message there was that the individual has a role in protecting society. And I thought that message came across, uh, you know, there is a positive to that individual focus as well. Yes, your behavior is important. But why is important is because not only do you protect yourself, but you also protect those around you. And I thought that was a fairly useful message that we would hope to transfer, you know, a greater engagement. Uh, we seem to have lost our way as regards our role in contributing to society and individualism as king to our current economic frameworks. So uh, uh, I, I think that was a positive learning and I would hope to try leverage that commitment to uh, public good that uh, came through uh, individual responses to COVID. Uh, thanks, um, John. thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for, a lot, again, a lot, a, an awful lot of um, insights in there and and you know it's it seems that you know environmentalists and health researchers working together is a very basic and very important form of interdisciplinary collaboration and indeed will be will be even more so going forward and yeah. um, i might i might turn um, to you um ida um i, I suppose to you know the, the the i suppose historical and humanities driven approaches um allow for you know for evidence to be combined and considered holistically for instance data on you know, on, on, on deaths, along with maybe narratives from archives of the experience of people who've lived through particular crises. Um, and these are, of course, are really valuable uh, pieces of research in themselves, and they stand on their own merits, but they can also inform how we make decisions uh, now and in the future. Would that be, would that be a fair assessment? Oh, I think that that's absolutely a fair assessment. And even just to refer back to, to Jonathan, Jonathan's point there about what we, our philosophy friends would call the social contract, Rousseau's idea, you know, that you have to surrender some of your rights to society in order to get them back. And, you know, we have all, I've, our, our, my students have learned about the social contract in a very practical way over the last pandemic. And I think, uh, you know, this pandemic has been a great teacher about many, many things. And the, the real difficulty with it is that we also have to learn how to listen. Um, but in terms of what we, uh, the, the kind of historical perspective, certainly um, my interviewees, you know, that I collected um, during my PhD work uh, between 2006 and 2011 or so, you, you know, they told us so many things that we could, could listen to uh, from now. And one of them um, often comes back to me, a guy called Tommy Christian. And I asked him the question about, um, you know, why didn't people talk about it when it was over? And he said, well, it was because it kept uh, coming back. It came back once, it came back another time, and it came back again. And again, this is to that thing, Trish, you raised about, you know, um, certainty and uncertainty, that we're longing for certainty, but we don't have it. And um, so T Tommy told me that, well, the idea was we just didn't talk about it anymore because then it wouldn't come back. Uh, we didn't talk about it unless it came back, you know, so um, I find that I'm constantly being interviewed at the moment with people looking for certainty and saying, well, what happened at the end of the Spanish flu? And really, I mean, I think the answer is nothing happened because people just let it go away and got on with their lives. And perhaps that's the really important lesson from Spanish flu, actually, is that we have to not do that. And we have to keep looking. Um, Ranger and Slack talk about pandemics or epidemics, ma major epidemics, shining a peculiarly bright light on society. And how important it is that, that they expose the, the flaws and the cracks in society, whether it's in health systems, whether it's in, as Trish, you, you mentioned, um, social inequalities. 
uh, that that are there already and how we address them. And, you know, for them, that was the real power of 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 the reflection at the end of pandemics um, is that we must look and see what needs to be fixed and what needs to be changed and not just let them go away. And just as a very practical example of what the humanities are doing um, at the moment in relation to our understanding of, um, you know, the impact of something like this on, on society. Um, Trish, you mentioned really good work coming out of Oslo, but I, I'll move University over to Oslo Met and look at the work uh, which Daniel Carey uh, is well familiar with because we had um, um, Sven Erik Mameland, uh, the historical geographer from Oslo Met, on, on a panel at, at the RIA, uh, a cross disciplinary panel, looking at COVID, COVID and his study of living conditions during the 1918 19 influenza pandemic identified housing density and educa educational attainment as a risk factor in pandemics. And then leading on from that research, he went on to survey all European influenza pandemic preparedness plans and found that because they were really dominated by medics making the decisions, that they seldom mentioned social inequality as a risk factor in pandemics, focusing instead on, on health risks like diabetes and heart disease. And now he has a, a PANSOC centre at OsloMet and again funded by MSCA funding there to many, many of his researchers. It's doing really important work surveying socially and ethnically vulnerable groups like the Sami um, to see how they reduce their inequality, both uh, how to reduce their inequality, both during pandemics and in under normal health conditions. Uh, so I think, you know, that kind of um, research is really important and it shows it's just a very practical example of the kind of angles um, that uh, an inf inclusive uh, disciplinary network can can bring to a big societal question like this. Yeah, thanks, Ida and and Trish. You may want to come back in there, and I, I know you know under you know marginalised groups and underrepresented groups and, and their 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 place within you know within the policy framework is something that you you know you address in your own research and you um you mentioned uh, you showed pictures early on in your presentation about you know the key messages you know like mm -hmm. stay home or you know stay alert mm -hmm. stay home but of course stay home someone who who you know people who have particular health conditions who need to be in hospital stay home as, as you alluded to stay home doesn't really work for them so it those it can it can ignore the needs of you know in in, in the I suppose in the rush to deal to to, to, to take action we can ignore I think the, the needs of, of particular groups Yes, and I think one of the things I've really enjoyed about this discussion is just how um, intellectually broad it is. Um, you know, we've, we've actually named particular philosophers, and I, you know, this is just fantastic, but, but the plain fact is that so many countries' response to the pandemic um, was, and you know, dominated by narrow biomedical scientific thinking and, and shifting the needle um, to embrace this wider group. You know, I presented you with pragmatism, you know, that's just where I'm playing at the moment to see if that'll, that'll help us. Um, but it's not the only, it's not the only way of doing this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's it's fascinating, but also kind kind of scary because this is a this is a big thing and not going to be easy to deal with. Thanks, thanks, Trish. Um, Patricia, I might I might ask um ask you first, and and indeed, it, uh, well, other panelists may wish to come in um around a kind of the implications for early career researchers from the kind of discussion we've been having, uh, and what needs to change in her in terms of how we in terms of the career development of early career researchers and their training. Um, in, in your view? I think that it's a great question, but a really hard one in that, yeah. you know, there's that sort of uh, dual challenge of being expert enough in your own area that you feel, you know, that you're it's back to that kind of unknown unknowns, that you know what is known, that you're comfortable enough in, in that space, that so you have to have had enough time and training to really know your area, and yet at the same time be aware of all the other disciplines. Um, I suppose, I think, I'm fortunate to work in, in public health, which is by its nature very interdisciplinary. And um, I think we need to think about how we teach um, and, uh, you know, like what 
if you think about our undergraduates, we increasingly have them doing modules in other areas. So our medical students routinely now do a module, you know, on, on art appreciation or drama or music. Um, and so whether we need to think the same way in terms of our, our PhD students, our postdocs, certainly I know in Ireland, there's, you know, there's quite an emphasis on the kind of soft skills. And I think we've done a very good job on changing our training programs um, and identifying the need for those skills and that we really maybe need to be as explicit about um, acknowledging the need to work in an interdisciplinary way. And that in order to be able to do that, you need to have some understanding. So, you know, I worked and was trained you know, in clinical medicine and then as an epidemiologist, quantitative skills. And I remember doing my first training in qualitative methods and it was in um, grounded theory. And the person who was giving the course to me was saying, you know, is that table a table? And I thought my brain was going to explode, you know, like, so I, when I teach Epi 101, I, I use the slides from the X-Files, the truth is out there, you know, and that's, that was how I approach science, but, you know, so I was quite, you know, was well beyond being an early career researcher when I was introduced to qualitative methods, and I think it would be much better if our students were supported um, to do so earlier on. Yeah. Thanks, Patricia. Trish, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I just want to come in there. That's a that's a great story. That is just a fantastic story. One of the things I would say is that we've got to be careful not to conflate any story or any piece of text with qualitative research. And one of the problems with qualitative research, it's a bit like questionnaire research. I was teaching that the other day that any idiot can write 10 questions down and call it a questionnaire and then send it around to 3000 people and call it a survey. And we all know that, you know, there's a, actually a science to designing survey questionnaires. Likewise with qualitative data, just done a big study funded by the Medical Research Council actually, um, on case study and the difference between a proper mixed method case study and a story about an organization. Uh, and, you know, it's all right. If, if you're doing a trial, you've got to actually be certified and, and capable of doing a trial. You've got to work with a clinical trials unit. If you're just collecting stories from people, you can string them together and say, I've done qualitative research. And because some of the journals don't know the difference, you get some rubbish published in the journals. And then it reinforces people's views that qualitative research is pretty rubbish. And that is really, really problematic. Um, I would say the pragmatists would say that table is a table and you know they're not too keen on grounded theory, but that's another matter. But <laughs> um, we really do have to make sure that in our effort to embrace the arts and the humanities and the subjective experience of patients and staff and citizens, that we don't let in all sorts of rubbish that's going to mislead us. But then if we're actually deliberating on all the evidence around the table, hopefully the good stuff will rise to the top and the, and the less good stuff you know will get put somewhere else i hope that's helpful yeah absolutely thanks um Tr trish and patricia Murray, do you wanted to get in there yeah just coming at it from another angle um Peter, i mean i think like you know i think we have to find some ways of um bridging this divide i think between the academic uh, community or the academic sort of world i suppose and the policy world um and that's not quite that's not so easy but i mean you know you, there's no reason why you can't start at the doctoral and um, training uh, level you know because we're very used to this concept you know in in sort of um, in scientific training right in the kind of biomedical state where people go and they do their internship or they can do kind of you know they can go out and they can spend time as you know with a, a private company or something like that but you know that that idea of, of people spending a little bit of time i think in with a you know, a government department or, you know, a, 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 I don't know, an institute of public health or whatever, you know, but so, somewhere where that is either making or informing or, or developing policy, I think is actually quite important, you know, and, and maybe sort of trying to, 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 to pick up some of those kind of skills, because very often people are just talking different languages. Um, and, you know, and then there are other pressures that are different, like time pressures and all the rest of it. So I think that uh, just broadening out a little bit our, our, our sense of or proactively, I suppose, 
trying to break down those 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 um, uh, those uh, barriers between between academia and, and, and the world of policy is quite important. And there's big interest in this now, of course, because of COVID. Partly, I think, because people are suddenly, you know, woken up to the value um, of evidence and, and and the need for that. You know, so so it's quite. Um, I think probably even pushing at an open door. But uh, you know, it's just it's something we probably need to think about more. Mm. And it strikes me that 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 you know the precarity of academic careers you know is is a is just an issue in the background all the time here but you know um and, and the oecd actually did a really good report on this you know that you know a system that's you know that has a very you know narrow funnel you know in terms of you know established positions it, it mitigates against maybe crossing boundaries it mitigates against taking risks you know it maybe mitigates against new ways of thinking you know within within disciplines so it seems to me it's in the background there all the time and and you know that relationship between um uh, between you know precarity in academia and and you know more more substantive transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research um jonathan i might come to you i suppose what uh, what would you like to see coming through um say under the dorothy the the dorothy call the dorothy fellowship um for interdisciplinary research to address public health crises what kind of what kind of stuff would you like to see coming through that you know that in your in your view would be really tackling you know key challenges from an from an, an EPA environmental perspective? Yeah, I, one of the biggest challenges we have, uh, and I know it can be a, a boring topic for many, is around data. You know, we don't really have a good understanding from primary morbidity and mortality data what the environmental uh, what the environment plays uh, in that. So this is collecting, you know, data collected at a primary physician or at hospitals. We have a good idea about where air quality. So if there is chronic asthma and if there are environmental factors, but that's about it really. And what, so with these, with the Dorothy program, I would like to see somewhere along the way that uh, uh, these fellowships, fellowships, fellowships would try to tackle this breakdown in data that we, we don't have good primary data at, at, at clinician level right through to hospitals on where and what role the environment, be it in their domestic environment or their environment at large, is playing in their health outcomes and in their disease burden. And that really needs to, because if, if we don't know what the problem is, and uh, we have all bits here and there, but I think it would allow us plan a much more integrated response to the challenges uh, if we could have this. And even we even find challenges, and Patricia will probably be aware of this, but we're working with ESRI at the moment to kind of overlay maps of environmental quality data with health data using the tilde. Uh, data set and GUI, although GUI is much harder to get at. So we're finding the rules of access to data in GUI and TILDA makes it very difficult for us to merge really important data sets on environmental quality with uh, uh, reported health uh, in these data sets. And we need to unblock that. And, and if the fellowships or if the Dorothy program can provide some researchers to take on those challenges, I think that would be a huge step forward for us and really getting uh, far better answers and actually um, better informed uh, policy outcomes. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. And I see a question about just the, you know, the what what the emphasis, what what will the emphasis be on on track record for the um, for the Dorothy call? But we will um, we'll have a presentation on on Dorothy shortly, and of course that'll be clearly set out in the in in the call in due course. Um, some questions coming in here about um, um, some questions coming here about the about the media. Um, I might put that one to you just briefly, and um, Trish, um, uh, where and I think it's probably related to misinformation as well. Um, maybe it's already been I've lost it now, but it was yeah. What do you think the media in general played a constructive part in the pandemic in the UK? Um, I heard John Ashton being referred to as a ranting professor on Sky News at one stage, which was very worrying. Um. I think journalists played an absolutely crucial role. Um, some of my best academic publications, I went into partnership with um, journalists. Zeynep Tufeci, for example, from, I think she writes for The Atlantic and The New York Times. 
um, hugely bright woman. She has an academic affiliation, but she's mainly a journalist. And if you remember, I talked about conjunctive theorizing and bringing together lots of evidence. Some of the best pieces of, of thinking about the pandemic came from journalists who were doing that kind of what Seth Abramson calls curatorial journalism. And it's a, it's a real academic skill. So I, I'm actually pretty positive about some corners of the media. Uh, I think the media had a very, very difficult job to do in the pandemic. Um, and I think they were, you know, they have a particular funding mechanism as well. And, and one of the things that went badly was this whole idea of both sides journalism, where you'd get somebody to give one side and someone to give the other side. And I've already spoken about how, how damaging that was. Um, but I, I don't think we can blame the media for the mess we got ourselves into. I, I think the media did their job and it was variable, but the best bits of the media were, I think, better than the best bits of academia, to be honest, is my, my personal view. As the, I'm being deliberately provocative, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, Jonathan, you wanted to come in there? You're on mute, Jonathan. Thank you. Two years later, and I'm still making fundamental errors. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I heard someone from Neffet, and, and I thought it was really good. I found, uh, I must admit, I found elements of our media, even our not our salacious media, you know, our mainstream, well informed uh, media, that, that this kind of obsession with what aboutery, I think, you know, and putting preposterous. Uh, 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 scenarios to uh, scientific uh, 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 thought leaders on radio or on TV or uh, and, and other academics, and it just got into a wild game of what aboutery. And once it was addressed, they went off to some other, and not based on any kind of rational scenario assessment. You know, when it comes to these what aboutries, I thought that they nurtured conflict between, uh, I thought they were very irresponsible at times in deliberately nurturing conflict on the radio uh, between different uh, uh, panelists. Uh, uh, so I, I was less than impressed, I must have, it, it, Trish is probably very generous from her UK, but I was less than impressed here. I thought that they uh, didn't do the public any great service with their love affair with the salacious and and controversy and good old fashioned arguments and fights on the radio and wild scenario posturing with all of their what about her questions. I, I don't think there is a major challenge for us to somehow engage with our media and bring them along and nurture uh, um, uh, from our grounded debate. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um... And um, I was going to finish with you, Ida. So, and I know you put up your hand anyway. So that's very that that's good. Um, so uh, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, um, I was actually going to say quite the opposite of Jonathan. Um, I was very lucky to be a fly on the wall in, in, in a group that was set up in February 2020 by Professor Oshin O'Connell, a respiratory consultant from Cork, where he included uh, members of medics from many different disciplines and politicians, uh, the chief medical officer, the minister for health, uh, journalists from all the leading newspapers and, and, and um, broadcast media as well, and one historian. And um, the idea of that was very early on in the crisis to share good quality information, studies that we mightn't all have access to as, you know, you know, if we didn't have access to, to academic publications, but also to get good quality people out onto the media talking within their own silo and not with outside their own silo. So that uh, broadly speaking, like, you know, if I, I was invited on and they asked me a science question, I was going to say, sorry, I can't talk about that, but I will talk about my field. And the other people in that group did so. And out of that group came several people who like, um, were probably already uh, pretty much media stars like Luke O'Neill or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, Kim Roberts um, and more the immunologist in Cork, uh, Kim the virologist in TCD and people like that who, who were called upon regularly by the media and I think I, I have to disagree with, with Jonathan I think for the most part I mean there were some of those incidents and indeed a recent case that kind of promoted uh, 
vaccine hesitancy, probably in a way that I think was irresponsible. Um, but um, you know that 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 broadly speaking, the media was was quite responsible here compared to the UK media. Okay, differing perspectives on on, on the media, but <laughs> we you can know, agree to differ. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm going to uh, running out of time, and I think that's probably as much time as we have for the panel. Uh, I just want to I want to thank all all our panelists, um, uh, Patricia, Jonathan, Ida, Murray, and Mairead. Um, I think it's a really rich discussion. And we're now, um, I'm now delighted to um, introduce Sandra Lefroy, who's going to speak a little bit about her grand aunt, um, uh, Dorothy St- Stopford Price. And then we will have a brief presentation from my colleague, Brenda Blake, on the Dorothy uh, Fellowship call. So um, hopefully, Sandra, yeah, I see your, your name has appeared there. And i um, really delighted to have you with us today and uh, look forward to hearing a little bit more uh, about Dorothy. I'm just trying to get the video up. It's not coming for me. We can hear you anyway, so. Ah, oh, there I am. <laughs> there you are. Welcome. Hello. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, my great aunt, Dorothy Stopford Price, was born in Dublin in 1890, a niece of historian and nationalist Alice Stopford Green and granddaughter to Dr. Every Kennedy, master of the Rotunda Hospital. Following her father's early death from typhoid, the family moved to London, where Dorothy completed her formal education, returning to Dublin to study medicine in Trinity College in 1916. Following graduation, Dorothy's first posting was as dispensary doctor in Kilbritton, County Cork. She also worked in this area during the War of Independence, giving lectures on first aid and treating injured members of the West Cork Flying Column. Despite an Anglo-Irish background, she'd begun to question her political allegiances and embraced Irish nationalism, having been particularly revolted by the execution of the leaders of the Rising. Dorothy never talked down to children and always treated them as equals. Consequently, they trusted her and told her their troubles. And this was probably a huge factor in her success as a pediatrician. As our aunt, she was very much a champion to my sister and me, and rightly or wrongly, went out of her way to protect us whenever we had committed some childhood indiscretion and were in trouble with the powers that be. Through her later work with Dr. Kathleen Lynn at St. Alton's Hospital, Dorothy became very much interested in the problems associated with tuberculosis, which was then particularly rampant amongst poor families in Dublin. She investigated best international practice, making contacts with doctors and research scientists in other countries with a view to establishing a vaccination program in Ireland, mainly through the medium of the newly discovered BCG treatment. Dorothy's tireless work became recognized in the Irish medical community and the success of her active promotion of the BCG vaccine was remarkable particularly considering constraints for women in the profession in those early years. She and her colleagues formed a quite extraordinary group of pioneering women, and their work at St. Alton's and elsewhere undoubtedly paved the way for others to follow in their footsteps. At that time, it was inevitable that health matters would become embroiled in a struggle between church and state, and Dorothy's efforts to establish an anti-tuberculosis league suffered as a result of the conflict. Archbishop John Charles McQuaid was a formidable force, and it was obvious that Dorothy's gender and faith were matters that displeased his grace. Dr. Noel Brown eventually crowned Dorothy's efforts when he appointed her head of the National Vaccination Programme in 1949. I'm going to finish by quoting the late Professor Victor Millington Singh. To her, more than anyone else, is due the credit of introducing into Ireland modern ideas of and preventive measures against tuberculosis. Few of the many thousands of children and young people who have been saved from death or tedious illness by BCG realize what they owe to Dorothy Price. Thank you. That, that was a really lovely um, mini biography of Dorothy's life, Sandra, and thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. And I think we're delighted to be, we're delighted to be naming the fellowship after Dorothy Stopford Price and uh, I think my most deserving. Well, the uh, family feel very honoured that she, she is being recognised in this way and it's lovely.
Yeah, that's no, that's fantastic. And thank thank you again, Sandra. Um, uh, we'll move on to we'll move on to to Brenda, um, who will give a brief presentation about the fellowship call. Brenda, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, so my connection seems to be a little bit weak today, so please do stop me if it's breaking up, and I'll I'll hand over to my colleague. So I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, share your screen and maybe keep your camera off, and that might that might help with the bandwidth. Okay. Okay, so you might let me know if you can see the presentation now, if it's come up on the screen. Um, not yet. Okay, sorry, let me just try that one more time. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, good to go. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. So the Dorothy Co-Fund programme is co-funded by the European Commission and it is led by the Irish Research Council in collaboration with the Health Research Board and the Environmental Protection Agency. The programme has been designed in line with Horizon 2020 MSCA best practice. And I would just like to pay tribute to all those who contributed to its design and in particular to Dr. Chiara Loda for her work on the proposal. This programme has been designed to respond to the need to equip societies with experts who are trained to address challenges in public health crisis. The main features of Dorothy is that it's innovative, interdisciplinary, international and intersectoral. So the Dorothy programme is a postdoctoral research programme. It's open to res researchers from all disciplines at any career stage, provided that the proposed research relates to public health crisis. The aim of the program is to recruit and to train 25 researchers who will be recruited via two calls, with the first call opening in the coming weeks, and the timeline for the second call will be announced in the coming weeks on our website. This is an opportunity for researchers of all nationalities based within and beyond Ireland, and the program aims to break down barriers between different academic disciplines and between sectors by driving collaboration between researchers and industry to help tackle public health crisis effectively. So what are the aims of the Dorothy Programme? The Dorothy Programme aims to support fellows career development through excellent training, supervision and mentoring. It will create a critical mask of well-networked experts from all disciplinary areas to tackle future public health crises. Dorothy will also aim to prom promote the dissemination and communication of impactful research beyond traditional academic channels. It will target policymakers and the population at large with the objective of contributing to resourceful and resilient societies. It will also pioneer an innovative multidisciplinary approach to the way public health crises are understood and tackled with solutions emerging from cooperation between disciplines, sectors, and research areas. So how is the Dorothy program structured? As I mentioned, the program has been led by the IRC in collaboration with the HRB and the EPA. 25 researchers will be awarded a three-year postdoctoral fellowship. So each grant will last 36 months, and the fellow is, in, is required to engage in international mobility. So to begin with, the fellow will undertake an outgoing phase of 18 months abroad in a non-Irish HEI, which can be based anywhere in the world, and an 18-month return phase in Ireland in an Irish HEI. The fellows will be encouraged to undertake a non-academic secondment, which can take place during either the outgoing or the return phase. The opportunity to undertake a secondment is one of the distinctive features of the Dorothy program. The secondment can be between three and six months, and the goal is to offer fellows the opportunity to engage with a non-academic sector, to acquire research skills with a focus on how research is done and how it's approached in a non-academic setting, gaining access to the different methodologies and infrastructures used. Along with these new skills, fellows will be able to build their network and will be provided with opportunities for exposure to non-academic stakeholders, which will help build bridges and enable communication between academia, industry, nonprofit, and policymaking. 
The fellow will also have the opportunity to build on their transferable skills by working as part of a team and as a comment host, availing of training opportunities in their host organization, which will help accelerate the fellow's post Dorothy career. Fellows can include a secondment either at the proposal submission stage or at the implementation stage, and they will be free to propose a non-academic secondment host of their choosing, which can be in Ireland or elsewhere, or the fellow can avail of the list of interested placement hosts, which will be available on the dedicated project website for Dorothy, which will go live in a couple of weeks. The next feature of Dorothy is the supervisory panels. Each fellow will be supported by an integrated supervisory panel, which consists of a main supervisor who will be based in the Irish HEI, an outgoing supervisor who will be based in the HEI outside of Ireland, a secondment supervisor if a secondment is chosen, and finally a mentor. Supervisors will endorse the Dorothy Supervisory Charter, which sets out a standard of excellent and consistent supervisory practices, and which enables a well-developed mentorship structure. The main role of supervisory panels will be to monitor the fellow's progress, provide hands-on training and top-class advice, to perform a skills audit, to provide support in identifying pertinent training opportunities and to advise, advise on appropriate dissemination, exploitation and communication outputs. To ensure the highest degree of excellence of oversight on the program, a number of advisory and review boards have been set up. The two decision-making bodies are the Funders Board and the Steering Committee. The Funders Board consists of representatives of the three funding agencies and a regular review of the Dorothy programme will be undertaken. Through feedback and suggestions, proposed changes can be made to Dorothy's structure to enhance the coordination and implementation of the programme throughout its course. The steering committee will be the main body for strategic direction and meetings will be convened to review feedback and to make recommendations and decisions on any points which are escalated by the supervisory committee. As well as these two decision-making bodies, the program is supported by three advisory boards, the Research Excellence Board, the Training Board, and the Communication Dissemination and Exploitation Board. These boards are made up of members who have been invited due to their experience and qualifications to enhance the innovative nature of the Dorothy program and to enhance equality and diversity. The boards will review the fellows' progress via their career development plans, they will review training needs, events and long-term career plans, and they will make suggestions for a CDE strategy to enable fellows' findings to be accessible and exploitable by numerous stakeholders from different sectors. And the last feature of the Dorothy programme that I will cover is the training programmes, which are, are an integral part of Dorothy. The fellow will be able to avail of both individual training and program-wide training. For individual training, fellows will identify their training needs and they will create a training needs analysis based on the VTE framework and they will be supported by their supervisory panel in doing this. Fellows will also be supported by their HEI and or their secondment hosts to identify training modules that they can avail of which may be discipline specific advanced training, or it may be other skills such as leadership and presentation, with a view to targeting both research and transferable skills to facilitate upscaling and, and preparation for their career post Dorothy, with an emphasis on communicating effectively to policymakers and to audiences beyond their disciplinary fields. In terms of program-wide training, the Dorothy program aims to enable the fellows to develop as a cohort and to share and exchange knowledge. Four program-wide training events will be held as well as a final conference. These events will take the form of workshop style modules which will facilitate the transfer of knowledge through inter interactive workshops and there will be multi-day training events. Elements such as interdisciplinary approaches will be examined as well as policy communication and development and dissemination and public engagement strategy. So this covers the main features of the Dorothy program. The Dorothy team are working on a pre-recorded webinar, which will be circulated in March. And this will include more specific details around the exact timing of the call around eligibility requirements, including mobility rules. We will also cover the submission process, which will be via Smart Simple, 
and we will include links to documentation and infrastructure that can assist in preparing your application. As I mentioned, there will be a dedicated website launched in March, which will be live for the duration of the program, and it will be regularly updated. And initially, you will be able to find all of the call documentation, and the list of the comment hosts will be available for download. And any program related questions that you've asked in the Q&A today will be integrated into our FAQ document, which will be circulated in the coming weeks. So thank you for your attention, and I'll hand it back to you, Peter. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks very much. Um, and we're pretty much out of time. Um, and I see some questions coming in there. Um, and and uh, as, as Brenda has said, we will, um, any Dorothy specific questions, we'll incorporate into the FAQs um, document for, for Dorothy. Um, so really, um, uh, all that really remains then is, is I suppose, is, is to close this, this seminar. It's been, it's been a, a really stimulating and engaging and insightful uh, afternoon, I think, of discussion uh, and debate. And I want to thank um, I want to thank Pr Professor Trish Greenhouse for a really fantastic opening keynote, um, which I think set the set the scene for our discussion today, um, and I think has given people much food for thought. Um, so thank you, Trish. And I know you're extremely busy and have so much demands on your time, but thank you so much for Can taking. I just say I've yeah. been trying to answer questions, but yes. I haven't managed to answer all of them. So sorry about that. Well, I actually meant to say thank you because I noticed you've been actually answering some, attempting to answer some questions individually, um, and thank you for doing that, Trish. Um, and I know, I know you've actually answered. You've, you've given a response to to a number of the questions that have come in. And we'll try and make sure that any outstanding questions um, that we get around to. So thank you once again, Trish. I'd also like to thank our, our panel members, uh, Dr. Mairead O'Driscoll, Dr. Ida Milne, uh, Dr. Jonathan Durham, um, and uh, Professor Patricia Carney. I also want to thank uh, Sandra for Sandra Lafroy for making the time to join us today to talk a little bit about Dorothy Stepford Price. Um, and I hope I have uh, the only other group then I have to thank. Um, is, is Brenda on the IRC team for her presentation and indeed all her work in organising this seminar um, supported by Dr Rachel Clark and, and Dr uh, Grainne Walsh. Um, and that's really all uh, uh, and have a good afternoon and thank you again for all your engagement. <laughs>